What's crack? Big dogs. Hope y'all have uh, enjoyed the featured films being hand placed onto the channel these last few days. I'm so proud of the BDG boys. We're absolutely rolling. We're rocking. We're helping you with everything Dynasty and Rookie related up until the NFL draft. Today is no different. I am continuing upon the rookie mock draft I did on Tuesday. So if you're in the Dynasty space and you got your rookie drafts coming up in a couple weeks, I did a first round mock draft. First round Dynasty rookie super flex mock draft. The first 12 picks. Today, we will be doing the next 12 picks, otherwise known as round Two. All right. So welcome back to the channel. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE Big Dogs Gotta Eat. And if you want the single best dynasty and rookie content out on the interwebs, you'll subscribe to this channel because that's what we are bringing to y'all. If you want to watch that original video, which would make a lot of sense rather than just skipping to picks 13 through 24, watch that video down below. We did a one quarterback one and we did a super flex one. So we've got both of them up in our movie theater. Okay. Both linked below. I'm ready to get into the content. If y'all are you know the next steps. We're going to tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. We're getting a lot of questions about our rankings, about draft guide, and all those products that we try to sell to you guys later on. We are going to only give content and value to you guys probably for the next month or two. We're not going to sell you on anything, all right? So those will be coming, but later on. For now, we're going to into the fucking content. All right, at the 201, continuing on this rookie mock draft, we have Mr. Chris Olave, wide receiver out of Ohio State, probably the third best wide receiver on that team right now with that really good underclassman and Mr. Garrett Wilson. But Chris Olave is a wonderful consolation prize. He kind of fits into that, the, the 111 to like 203 spots that we've seen become a staple of really solid fantasy wide receivers over the last few years. It's kind of like you miss out on the elite quarterbacks and the elite running backs and the one or two elite wide receivers that each class has. And then you have really safe, solid fantasy wide receiver twos at that turn. And Chris Olave falls right into that mold where it was like the Jalen Waddles, the Elijah Moores, the Rashad Batemans, and the Ayukes, and the Higgins, and the Pittmans, and the Ju and the list goes on and on and on. He is in that mold. He's going to be a really, really solid pro, okay? He's a great route runner, a great separator. He can really run any route. He's going to he's gonna go to an NFL team and be able to contribute right away. He doesn't have the ceiling of some of these other wide receivers that went off the board in the first round, like the Garrett Wilsons and the Drake Londons and the Traylon Burks. But Chris Olave, my comp for him is Tyler Lockett. He's kind of small, but he's a downfield playmaker. He could run any route. He could separate. He's likely going to be wide receiver two in fantasy, but if he needs to be the wide receiver one on his team, he can do that for a prolonged period of time. You don't necessarily want to build your offense around him, but he can be that guy if need be. So Chris Olave, really good route runner, really good separator, just a really solid pro is what he's going to be. He's my 201 at the 202, Kyron Williams. What I watched on film from 2020 to 2021 was a monster, monster improvement. Okay. I try to be as unbiased as possible when I'm looking at my running backs and evaluating them. So I watch only film and then I get my takeaways and then I dive into the numbers to either back up or play devil's advocate against what I found. And with Kyron Williams, he was one of the guys where I didn't like him at all in 2020. When I watched the 2021 film, I was like, yo, he looks a lot better. And then when I looked at the numbers, the numbers also scream that, right? When I'm looking at PFF, when I'm looking at Sports Info Solutions, the elusiveness and the missed tackle ratings and all of that kind of shit improved dramatically year over year. So my eyes were not telling me no fucking lies about Mr. Kyron Williams. My concern with Kyron Williams is his size. Is he going to come in at two, 207 pounds? Is he going to come in at 197 pounds? I don't know. Is he a great player? He is probably the best pass blocker as well as the best pass catcher in this class right now. If he's too small, he's going to be pigeonholed as a third down running back at the next level. I don't make the fucking rules, okay? The NFL executives and coaches who make dumb decisions do that. Can Kyron Williams play all three downs? Sure. He got huge workloads at Notre Dame. How many times have we seen undersized running backs in the NCAA get huge workloads only to go get pigeonholed in the NFL? That is my concern with Kyron Williams. My concern with him is not as a player. My concern with him is his size and automatically getting forced into the third down role. Draft capital, where he lands, is also going to dictate how far he goes up. If he gets drafted ahead of Rashad White, and if he gets drafted into a situation with much more opportunity than Rashad White, there is a very good chance that I flip Kyron Williams over Rashad White in my mock drafts and in my rankings. But for right now, based off just what I've seen on the film, he's my 202. That ain't no fucking light work. That's a, that's a good spot to get picked. Number three, Jahan Dotson, Penn State wide receiver. He could have some size concerns. He's listed at 5'11", 1 
90. I'm listening to some content that Ray GQ puts out. Shout out Ray G's doing some of the best dynasty and Debbie work in the space right now. Rumor is that he avoided, he was supposed to go to the senior bowl, ended up dropping out. The rumor is because he was going to come in way undersized rather than 5'11", 190, more like 5'9", 180. Jahan Dotson is a guy who absolutely sticks out to me on film. He's someone that I watch. And I'm like, damn, like he's something special. His separation and route running skills are going to be a huge, huge asset to a team at the next level. A lot of people are going to compare Jahan Dotson to KJ Hamler, an undersized speedster out of Penn State. Couldn't be more fucking different, right? KJ Hamler is more Taylor Gabriel than Jahan Dotson is. Jahan Dotson, my comp for Jahan Dotson is T.Y. Hilton. My comp for Kyron Williams, I think a lot of people just like to throw players into comps with like their upside. I'm not about to say like Austin Eckler. I do see Geo. I see Geo and Kyron Williams a lot. And here's the thing. If Geo was ever given a three down roll, he always operated really, really efficiently. Like I believe Geo could have been a top 12 running back for a long time if a team had just given him that role. They just never did. They pigeonholed him into three down roll. Happens a lot. Even Austin Eckler probably wasn't going to be the RB1 that we saw him become until Melvin Gordon held out. Who knows if Austin Eckler ever becomes Austin Eckler if Melvin Gordon is happy with his contract and gets in the backfield and plays his football. Like We don't know what actually happens there, but we do know that football teams will not let you see that upside unless something does happen. So Kyron Williams is more Geo to me, and that's not a bad thing. Gio was a very good NFL player for a long time and probably had a lot more upside waiting in the tank that he never got to fucking pull the trigger on. Okay. So Jahan Dotson to me, great route runner, supposedly going to run a really, really, really good 40 time, but I don't even care about that 40 time. He could run a four five five and I'd still be impressed. He has like, I'm not going to say Devonte Smith type levels of separation skills, but he could be slow and still get excitement out of my ass. All right. So Jahan Dotson to me could come in undersized, T.Y. Hilton is 5'9", 180, exactly what we think Jahan Dotson might come in as. So I love Jahan Dotson here at my 203. 204, another wide receiver, Mr. George Pickens out of Georgia. There's been a lot of buzz about Pickens over the last few weeks. People love Love George Pickens. Now, he was pretty consensus top three wide receiver in this class coming into the season. He tore his ACL during summer practices, summer camp or whatever. So he missed basically all of 2021. He did come back at the end of 2021, really, really early off the ACL. So that's just to say there's no concerns going into his actual rookie year of whether or not he's going to be on the field with the torn ACL. Most people would agree that if Pickens, again, didn't tear the ACL, he would be somewhere in the wide receiver one, two, or three conversation for this class. With George Pickens, I watched the film and like, there's a lot to be excited about. He's explosive. He's a playmaker down the field. Broke out really, really, really early, right? As a freshman, he came in and, and really, really did his thing. And that's obviously something that we want to see. People are saying he's a great route runner. I didn't really quite see it when I watched the film. For me, George Pickens falls into the Chase Claypool, Mike Williams, kind of like molded into what he's going to be on the outside. But I mean, I've been wrong before. So a lot of people are like T Higgins ish, you know, some people will come in and say like, he's a great route runner and he could actually operate as the X and the alpha in an offense. I see him more of a, as a situational guy, but that's not to say like Chase Claypool was awesome as rookie year. Mike Williams has had 10 touchdown seasons and thousand yard seasons. I just don't see George Pickens. You know, a lot of people are going to see Pickens in the Georgia uniform and say like, oh, he looks a lot like AJ Green. He ain't fucking AJ Green. All right. You're not that guy, pal. Trust me. That's that. At least that's not what I saw. So Pickens, I don't necessarily see the upside a lot of people do, but again, there are a lot of smart people that have been right about things that I've been wrong about. So you always want to get into a range of outcomes where you're not pigeonholing yourself into like, I can't pick this guy because I don't like him because other people see an upside that you don't see and it might hit that upside. So with George Pickens, really good all around wide receiver, broke out really early, would have had a lot more hype had this not been like a forgotten season for him because of the ACL. 205, David Bell, Purdue wide receiver. I talked uh, at nauseum about him, I forget what episode it was in, but David Bell is a guy that I'm not particularly excited about my comp for David Bell was Sterling Shepard, who is a good separator, good with the ball in his hands. He has a little bit more of that like spectacular catch Madden trait in his game where sometimes you'll watch the highlights and you'll be like, holy fucking, you know, that was an incredible play. He had made that one play where he like leaned back and it was an insane play. It might've been against Ohio State. And you're like, oh, he's doing it against Ohio State. But he did basically nothing in that game outside. He, he has, he had trouble from what I saw separating against elite cornerback talent and elite secondary talent. And his numbers are really, really big. And one of my concerns with guys like David Bell, and we've seen it with like Rondo Moore and Visca and a lot 
lot of these guys who put up dominant seasons really, really early because they're the best athlete on their team. Thus, they're force fed balls at the line of scrimmage. And you see their yards per reception and their yards per target number become really, really low because they're just getting force fed volume. It doesn't actually mean that they're a great wide receiver. I'm not saying David Bell can't be a good wide receiver. Not every rookie wide receiver you draft that you like is going to be a high end fantasy wide receiver asset. You know, some guys are just going to be flex plays for you. Some guys are going to be low end wide receiver twos for you. They don't actually move the needle. David Bell for me feels like that kind of guy. But again, there are a lot of people that are really excited about David Bell. So he, he, along with George Pickens are probably guys I'm going to go back, rewatch, see if I come with a different outcome because there's a lot of hype around these guys. And I think it's fucking worth going back and looking at, because if you miss on these guys, then you're probably going to end up picking shitty players like Terrace Marshall and Trey Sermon. Let's take it wrong. Sorry. All right. The 206. And this is probably the last of the top quarterbacks in the class. And this is Carson Strong out of Nevada. I just don't see it. And I watched his film a few weeks ago. And when I watched it, I was like, this guy just reminds me of Jimmy G. He screams Jimmy G to me. And a lot of people were excited about Carson Strong. And then he went to the Super Bowl, Senior Bowl, and he disappointed, apparently. Slip like 40. And I was not surprised at all. When I watched him, I didn't see that strong of an arm. This is why you need to do your own research and watch your own film, right? If you only listened to Dynasty podcasts up until this point, you would think Carson Strong is 6'6 with the strongest arm in the class. And neither of those things are true, okay? For Carson Strong, he's seems like a guy who's constantly checking the ball down. It's like a fucking tape measurer where after 15 yards, that shit gets floppy. That's how his throws are, honestly. Carson Strong is not a guy that I see having a lot of success at the NFL level. Again, he's like Jimmy G where he will take that check down. If, if your entire offense has yak monsters like San Francisco does and all the quarterback has to do is check it down, Carson Strong could be perfect in that sense. But there's not a lot of offenses where that kind of player will succeed. There is not even a guarantee that Carson Strong is a first round pick in the NFL draft. Okay. So I will, again, like most of these quarterbacks, let the NFL draft dictate how high I want to take these guys in rookie drafts. So if Carson Strong ends up going like top 12, I'm going to reconsider. And he's not going to drop to the 206. He's going to be the back end of the first round, et cetera. If he ends up being like pick 35 in the second round, we don't have a lot of historical success with quarterbacks being drafted outside of the first round. Of course, you can nitpick the ones that do, but more often than not, if they're dropping out of the first round, they're probably not quality starting quarterbacks in the NFL. Thus, Carson Strong will drop to a space like this in the rookie rankings and rookie drafts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's move to the 207. Tyler Algier out of BYU. This will be one of the more polarizing players in the draft class. He is a guy, much like I talked about Isaiah Spiller in the last video, I just don't think Tyler Algier is a great runner. He's kind of like a discount Isaiah Spiller, in my opinion, actually. Here's my thing with Tyler Algier. You could look at a lot. Of, you're going to look at the production. You're going to look at the size. You're going to look at a lot of parts of his profile and be like, why is this guy not more highly ranked? And honestly, I would ask you that. How can someone with that profile, right, running for 1,600 yards, 5'11", 220 pounds, catching passes, why is he not getting picked higher in rookie drafts? That's the thing. So we'll lay out the good and we'll lay out the bad, all right? I think he has a lot of things that do translate to the NFL. Again, that size, 5'11", 220 pounds. He is built like a workhorse back at a BYU. The speed, you know, you'll hear if you Google this shit, you'll hear he's going to run like a 4.35. Not going to happen. If he runs anywhere near 4.5, if he runs a 4.49, a 4.52 even, the weight adjusted speed score is going to be really, really high for him. And that's obviously a massive plus for any NFL back. He caught passes. He caught a lot of passes. 28 passes his final year, which is more than enough for me to feel like he is uh, well-equipped at the pass catching level and can play on third downs on Sundays. So you're looking at... A 220 plus pound running back, all three years went over 1,200 yards from scrimmage, 1,800 yards from scrimmage his final year, caught 28 passes, and he's going at the, the end of the second round in rookie drafts. So here is my problem with Tyler Algier. He is a north to south runner. He is not agile. He is not elusive. And we have seen this year over year over year with guys like Tevin Coleman, with guys like Darrell Henderson, with guys like Chuba Hubbard. And this was like the same argument I made for Darrell Henderson when he came out, and people loved him. And it was the same argument I made for I've, I've made for a lot of backs where you could just watch them. You could tell they're not elusive, but they're putting up these big productive seasons. And there's a very clear reason why when you're playing at schools like BYU or at schools like Memphis or schools like Oklahoma State, whatever, when you're not playing against real 
NFL competition and you're able to have real NFL speed. So a guy like Tyler Algier, so a guy like Darrell Henderson, so guys like Chuba Hubbard and Tevin Coleman have legitimate like 4-4 speed, 4-4-8 speed or whatever. When you're playing against shitty competition, the guys that you're running against are chasing you with like 4-8, 4-9, non-NFL speed. And when you have a good offensive line, like Darrell Henderson's offensive line in Memphis was dominant that year. So you put a really good offensive line against subpar defenses who are, you know, their defensive line is not good, but the guys chasing the guy with real NFL speed is not fast either. That's going to lead to a ton of breakaway explosive plays. So that's going to lead to 50, 60, 70, 80 yard touchdowns, which we saw over and over and over again with guys like Darrell Henderson and Tyler Algier pumping up their production. I'm telling you, we've seen this many, many times and Tyler Algier, I got the exact same feeling from him as I got from Darrell Henderson. But again, like Isaiah Spiller, I like Algier more than I liked Henderson because he has a lot of things that will kind of wipe away. They're like deodorant for that kind of running style. When you're 220 pounds, when you can play on third downs, when you can have breakaway speed, teams are going to give you more leeway. You're going to have more leash and they're going to allow you to fuck up and be bad at running the ball more times than if you're smaller or if you're slower. So Algier could back his way into like a really productive fantasy role because of the positive traits he has. So again, it's always about range of spectrums. I don't think Algier is a good runner, which is like fucking, you know, who am I to say that when he just ran for 1700 yards or whatever. But again, I've, I've seen this trend. The more you do this, the more classes you go through, you start to see these prototypes of running backs that do the same thing. I actually want to look at Noah did a write up on Tyler Algier. He actually dropped a video, the randomizer video and Tyler Algier, I believe was in that as well. And there was something about the chunk rate, but the breakaway, I don't know what I'm saying, but I'm pretty sure it backs up what I was saying. If he's some dominant force, like an actually like good, refined, quality runner of the football, why is he not ripping off 10-yard runs? And the fact that his breakaway conversion rate is so high and his 10-yard run rate is so low is like, okay, he's not reaching the secondary as often as his teammates are. But once he's there, he's incredible. Yeah, so that's my take on Tyler Algier. I think he is a really good, a really good second round rookie pick. If he gets into the first round, I'd rather probably take one of the safer wide receivers. I'd rather take a quarterback because there's like four or five and then it will go borderline first round. But yeah, he's he's kind of an interesting player. At the 208s, some people might think this is early, but this should probably not come as a surprise if you have been in tune with the rookie hype in the dynasty class uh, for the last few weeks. And this is Mr. Christian Watson, North Dakota State University receiver. He is going to blast up rookie draft boards. And the only reason he's not up there right now is because he played at North Dakota State University. 6'4", 210 pounds. Speed. He's going to run in the low 4-4s. He is explosive. He absolutely dismantled cornerbacks at the Senior Bowl. Apparently, he was the far and away unanimous wide receiver one at the Senior Bowl, regardless of if these players were from the SEC or the Big 12 or whatever the case may be. Christian Watson was the best player there. He is super fun to watch on film. I really suggest you go watch his stuff. He was Trey Lance's guy when Trey Lance played at North Dakota State. He would actually be an incredible fit at San Francisco, absolutely nuke his fantasy value because they obviously have Kittle and IU and Debo and whatever, but he's a guy that is utilized in the run game to a very high degree for a guy who's a 6'4 wide receiver. They use him on end rounds. They let him take carries and he's really fucking good on the ground too. He has a lot of big explosive touchdown runs when they hand the ball off to him. So he'd be a great fit in that offense, but again, it would nuke his fantasy value. I also heard, I have a source that if, if your sports book allows you to bet Christian Watson as a first round NFL draft pick, smack that fucking button right now. I've heard things of Watson being drafted as high as a top 15 pick in the NFL this year. The source from a source from a source, but I trust my sources on sources on sources. Christian Watson, do yourself a favor. Do not let the hype get ahead of itself. Okay. It's already there, but it's worth it. This guy is a beast, really fun to watch. A lot of people are uh, comparing him to Martavis Bryant, but a more well-polished, more actual wide receiver type than Martavis Bryant was rather than just an explosive long playmaker down the field, which Watson is elite at that. So Watson, NDSU, go check that boy out. At the 209, we have Justin Ross, Clemson wide receiver. This kid is kind of like a knockoff George Pickens where he broke out really, really early. He's 6'4", 205, so nearly the same build, plays the outside well, can do a lot. However, injuries absolutely killed him. He was dealing, he had like a leg injury, but then like a spinal neck injury, some kind of shit. Again, I'm only technically a doctor here, so I don't want to break down the injuries, but apparently the injuries from this kid are a very, very, very big concern. And then when he finally got back on the field this year and was 
was healthy and got a full season together. I mean, he was playing with the Clemson quarterback, DJ fucking Tungalunga, whatever his name is, and he was absolute trash. So it wasn't like Justin Ross was actually getting balls that he can produce stats on top of stats on top of stats. So Justin Ross came in as a true freshman, was playing with Trevor Lawrence and went kind of nuts. A thousand yards as a true freshman, 18 years old, over 20 yards per reception. And that's been like his calling card. When you're a guy playing in, at Clemson with Trevor Lawrence, you're a true freshman at 18 going off for a thousand receiving yards. You're on the map of NFL teams immediately. And that will kind of hang around the Devian dynasty community. And he's a guy, I think if he can stay healthy in one way or another, you're kind of just, you know, rolling the dice. None of us are ever going to fucking know if he's going to stay healthy or not. But if he does, he's got a lot of upside. He can make big plays down the field. As I said, 20 yards per reception that break out freshman year. So Justin Ross, again, kind of like out of sight, out of mind because of the injuries, because of the bad quarterback play at Clemson. This is a guy that needs to be on your radar at the back end of second round of rookie drafts. Let's move to the 210. And the last quarterback that I'm probably going to scout in this year's class is Desmond Ritter out of Cincinnati. I know he's one of the more hyped up guys playing for the Cincinnati that got into the bowl championship, little turny turny. He was never a guy that looked like he had it to me. And then as the, you know, that, that game against Bama happened and then the senior bowl happened, like he just did not. I think his stock just continued to go down. He doesn't look like a guy who's going to be successful at the NFL level. But again, we're going to let NFL draft capital dictate whether or not we want him in rookie drafts. So he goes in the third round. He's a end of third round rookie pick in drafts. If he goes somehow in the first round, some team loves him and picks him at like 22 or some shit, you know, Washington or Pittsburgh does some fucking ignorant type of stuff. Then we take a second look at Ritter and say, hey, listen, he's going to get a starting job in the NFL. He's worth a higher super flex pick. But Ritter's just not a guy that I saw that I love. First tight end off the board, the 211. Trey McBride out of Colorado State. There will be some back and forth between Trey McBride and Jalen Weidemeyer out of Texas A&M. He is my tight end one. He was the nation's tight end one. He was the Mackey Award winner. He led the country in basically every statistical category out there at the tight end position among 100 tight ends with at least 25 targets this year. This info is per info uh, Sports Info Solutions. 131 targets this year. The next closest was this guy out of Old Dominion, Zach Kuntz. 114. Everybody else had fewer than 97. This guy had 131. He led the country with 91 receptions, 1,124 receiving yards. The next closest guy, 912. That was the only other player over 900 receiving yards. This guy had 1,124 receiving yards, fifth in yards per route run. I just, I like McBride a lot, man. You watch him play. He reminds me of someone who should have played football in the 1980s, where it's kind of like his pad height is big and you just don't want to fuck with him because he's going to rip your fucking head off. You're not going home to your family the night you play Colorado State and Trey McBride. This tight end class is just obviously not like what we've seen in recent years with the Pitts and the Hawkinsons and the guys who were going in the first round. Trey McBride is not overly great with the ball in his hands in terms of his yak. I think he's probably closer to like the Ertz or Hunter Henry than he is the Kelsey's or the Gronkowski's, which is a pretty big problem or red flag on the profile. I think the upside for fantasy tight ends a lot of the times comes in the yak ability, the Kittles, the Kelsey's, the Wallers, you know, those kind of things. If you're not catching 10 to 12 touchdown passes, which he could be a red zone threat, obviously then it's going to be hard to make that up in the statistical sense if you're not making plays with the ball in your hand. So for right now, McBride is my favorite tight end in this class. You know, if, if Weidemeyer goes like two rounds earlier than him and goes to a better team with a better situation, then I'll flip flop. It's not it's not something I'm like beholden to where he's in a, a tier that's way above uh, Weidemeyer. OK, so that's where I have my first tight end going off the board. Last player in this round, the 212. Let me know who you have at your 212. Drop down below any changes you would make to my list thus far and who you would have at the 212 based on the 23 players that have gone so far. And 212 is none other than the boy I will be hyping up for the remainder of the offseason, who I talk in depth about on my top five late round rookie running backs to take in your third and fourth round of rookie drafts. And that is Mr. Kennedy Brooks out of Oklahoma. Now, the beautiful part about Kennedy Brooks is outside of the people in my audience who I'm just going to make fall in love with him, he probably won't be a second round pick in rookie drafts. He will be back in third if you do mock drafts between now and then in sleeper with just your normal dynasty league. He's probably going to go at the end of the third round, maybe at the end of the fourth round. I believe I remember his ADP right now on player profiler is 47. So you're talking about a back end of the fourth round pick. Kennedy Brooks, I'm really really excited to see what he does at the combine because I think he's going to have a little bit more long speed than most people are giving him credit for okay I'm going to link the video where I went in depth on Kennedy Brooks down below so go watch that if you want to 
You want it absolutely fucking jacked up on Mr. Brooks? This is a guy who came in as a true freshman, ran for a thousand yards at Oklahoma, and then proceeded to do that in every year that he played at that school, despite battling guys like Ramondre Stevenson and Trey Sermon, having Kyler at quarterback, having Jalen Hurts at quarterback, having all these outstanding wide receivers there competing for touches. He just kept doing it over and over and over again. And if you look at basically every analytical category when it comes to being a good runner outside of the offensive line, yards created, missed tackles, elusiveness, yards after contact, breakaway runs. He is top 10 in the country year over year over year. He is a very, very good pure runner. But he's a guy who admittedly could end up going in like the sixth round of the NFL draft. And if that's the case, I'm not really going to be high on him anymore. If he runs like a 475, which I don't think is going to be the case, he might be, you know, he, he kind of looks like sometimes when he changes direction, he's like taking a nap before he decides to go from left to right. But that's neither here nor here. Still love the guy as a runner. The numbers back up what I saw on film as well. Love Kennedy Brooks. Hope he fucking blows up the combine. And I hope he shoots up draft boards because y'all heard it here first. Mr. Kenny Brooks out of Oklahoma. So that is my 212 pick. And just to recap that second round, actually, we'll go from all the way top of the one to the bottom of the two, starting from last week's video. Brees Hall at the 101, Traylon Burks, Kenny Pickett, Drake London, Malik Willis, Garrett Wilson, Matt Corral, Isaiah Spiller, Kenneth Walker, Sam Howell, Jameson Williams, Rashad White, Chris Olave, Kyron Williams, Jahan Dotson, George Pickens, David Bell, Carson Strong, Tyler Algier, Christian Watson, Justin Ross, Desmond Ritter, Trey McBride, and Kennedy Mother fucking presidential Brooks rounding out the first two rounds of our rookie drafts. Let me know who I missed out on. Let me know who you would have thrown into the back end of the second round. Let me know who I'm way higher on than you are or you're way higher on than I am. But most importantly, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you want to be locked and fucking loaded for your rookie drafts because that is what we are trying to deliver to you here at Big Dogs. Gotta eat. I love you, and I will see you. Uh, I think I'm going to do a full fantasy mock draft tomorrow. I think we're going to get on Underdog and do a 2022 draft for tomorrow. So if you're not on Underdog already, make sure you go to underdogfantasy.com. Sign up. Use promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 for the first time, and you'll be able to draft with me. We're going to do a live stream tomorrow. Fuck it. We're going live. Love you. Bye.